In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, class, are you ready? It is time for your final exam on the subject of don't be dumb. Yeah, you got that part right. Good for you. There are seven questions. Here we go. Question number one. The opposite of being dumb, or in biblical language, a fool, is being what? Good for you. The opposite of being dumb is being wise. Um, and so, for several weeks now, we have been exploring the subject of biblical wisdom. Question number two. Wisdom helps us make better what? Okay. Choices, decisions. Yes, y'all are doing great. Um, and see, this is the thing that is so cool about biblical wisdom. Um, it is so practical. Biblical wisdom isn't airy-fairy, pie in the sky, in the sweet by and by. No. Biblical wisdom can be applied to your life immediately in the here and now, today, as soon as you learn it. Question number three. Wisdom literature is found in the books of I, all I hear is mumbling, so the answer is Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. All right. Um, they're getting harder, aren't they? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Which leads us to question number four. According to Ecclesiastes, the meaning of life is what? Uh, well... According to Ecclesiastes, the meaning of life is hard to understand. It's, it, it's like a, a vapor. It's like a mist. You try to, to, to find it, and, and you think you have it, and then it just goes away. You, you can't wrap your brain around it. It's just too much. So what do you do? You fear God and keep his commandments. Again, very practical stuff. Question number five. According to Job, there is an answer for every tragedy. True or false? Yeah, you're right. According to Job, there's an answer for every tragedy. False. There are some things that are just too much for the human mind to understand. Y'all are doing great. All right. Now, pressure's building. <laughs> Have you accepted the 31 in 31 challenge? And just to refresh your memory, that is, have you made a decision to read all 31 chapters, one chapter per day, uh, for 31 consecutive days? And the answer is, well, it's never too late. <laughs> You, you can start today, and once you start, you need to stick with it. Because if you keep on going on day 17, you will read this. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. I don't know about you, but how many times do I wish I had kept my mouth shut? Amen. Amen. Then, if you keep on moving, on day 22, you'll read this. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of the lender. So that was written 3,000 years ago, and it's still true. You have to be very careful with debt. Well, in the book of Proverbs, there are 800 of these gems of wisdom. So please, consider the 31 
in 31 challenge. Question number seven. How do we become wise? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That is, as human beings, we need to uh, remember who God is and who we are. God is God, and we are not God. God is from everlasting to everlasting. We're a vapor, a mist, here today, gone tomorrow. God made it all. God owns it all. God runs it all. And God gets to make the rules. As creatures, our place is on our knees as humble, obedient, reverent, awestruck people. If we can get that right, wisdom will surely follow. Or said differently, if we don't get that right, we will be dumb. You said it, I didn't. <laughs> Somebody yelled out, dumb. All right. So, how did you do? Did, did you get all seven right? I, I hope so. Because nobody ever wants to be dumb, do they? Well, almost never. You see, there is a situation in which you should be dumb. At least dumb in the eyes of other people. And you will be dumb if you are, you will look dumb if you are a fool for Christ. A fool for Christ, what does that mean? And why would anybody even want to be a fool for Christ? Well, if you don't know the answer, Stay tuned, because you're about to find out. Let's take a look. So if, if, if you've been in the real estate market, if you've been buying or selling or even just paying taxes on a house, you know that these past few years have been absolutely crazy. I don't know if you can see this chart, but it... It tracks home prices in Houston since 2018. And on average, the prices have gone up something like 60%. That is insane. Some of that, of course, is just supply and demand. So many people are moving into the Houston area. But part of it is also the fact that houses themselves keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and the houses have more and more and more stuff in them. I saw this article that talked about 22 must-have features for houses in 2022. Here's a few of them. You can take a look at that. There, there's more. Um, but, but I, don't, I don't know about you, but I don't know what statement cabinets are. <laughs> and who even knew there were heated floors? How, how do you do that without having basements or something? I don't know. It's too much for me. I, I guess when it comes to luxury, there is no limit. But you know, when I think about these things and I contrast them with the words of Jesus that he spoke in today's lesson from Matthew, it gives me pause. Jesus said foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, the thing is, Jesus was talking there to people who wanted to be his followers. 
And although Jesus doesn't say it explicitly there, his words imply that his followers should travel light, just like he did. And then there was this. Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Now the text isn't clear whether the man's father was already dead or whether he was using that as an excuse. Well, okay, Jesus, I I want to be your follower, but first, wait until my dad dies. We don't know. But when it came to being a follower of Jesus, he didn't pull any punches. Over and over again, Jesus said, come, yes, come follow me. But your life will be different. It will be different from before. And it will be different from everybody else's. He went on to say this. He said, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up a cross and follow me. Now just to be to be clear, when Jesus said take up a cross, he, um, he didn't mean an annoying boss or a, a nasty in-law or a medical condition. No, no, when Jesus said take, take up a cross, the cross was a means of execution. Crosses killed people. And so to take up a cross was to die. It could have been physically, but I think more so he was talking about dying to our own selfish ways, as well as to the ways of the world. And it's here, I think, where the struggle lies for every Christian. The question is, how worldly are we, really? Um, Who influences our lives more? Other people or Jesus? Said differently, are we more like Jesus or everybody else? Now, that's a hard question, and it's always been a hard question. The Apostle Paul, way back in those days, wrote to the Christians in Rome. Uh, These were people who were seriously seeking to follow Jesus, but who seemed to have a foot in two different worlds. He said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. In other words, Christians need to learn to think differently and therefore act differently from everybody else. And so the question is, are you different? A couple of weeks ago, um, Karen and I were invited to a neighborhood birthday party. Um, And it was fun. I got to tell you, we had a great time. But it was also kind of weird. Host is a friend of mine. Um, He's a Christian, a really good guy. But it was still weird. I mean, because as we were meeting new people, the conversation was all about, you know, material things. It was all about trucks, new trucks, and shiny cars, and fancy vacations. I heard the women talking about jewelry. Um, And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Don't hear me say that. But one guy came in, and he was already drunk. And he was all touchy-feely. I mean, not just with the women, with everybody. I mean, he came and 
hugged me and touched me and creeped me out. And he, he, I mean, he was touching everybody. And not only was he doing that, but he was uh, like um, foul mouth. I mean, totally potty mouth. And it was like, why? It was so off-putting. And one guy I've known for a while, and he knows I'm a priest, and he said, hey, you want to hear a preacher joke? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> Didn't matter. He told it anyway. And the punchline ended with two words that begin with the letters MF. Oh. These were educated people, nice, friendly people, regular, everyday people, good jobs, take care of their kids, kind of, you could say they were model citizens in some ways. But Karen and I were kind of uncomfortable around them. We felt, well, out of place. Now, I'm not claiming that we're better. But I do think that's just kind of the way the world is today. That's the way worldly people are. That's the way they act. That's the way they talk. And Karen and I didn't really feel like we fit in very well. Somehow we felt different. And maybe that's why we don't get invited to many parties. That plus the fact that we're both really boring. It's true. But here's the thing. As the culture continues to move in the direction that it is, all Christians are going to feel increasingly out of place. Whether it's luxury homes or sexual morality or business ethics or whatever, Christians listen to a different drummer, and that drummer's name is Jesus. We believe in things like turning the other cheek. We believe it's better to give than to receive. We believe blessed are the poor in spirit. We know that you find life by giving your life away. It's just not the way that worldly people think. Most of all, we believe that we are sinners saved by grace through faith. That is, Jesus died an agonizing, bloody death on the cross for our sin. And he offers us a precious gift to those who will believe. But increasingly, in the eyes of the world, the message of the cross and new life in Christ is foolishness or worse. But guess what? God sees things differently. The word of God says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So what it really boils down to is this, who's, who's, who's the fool? Those who follow Jesus, even if they don't fit in with everybody else? Or those who live life apart from God and just do their own thing. As we now come to the end of this series, I would ask you one final question. And that is, which kind of fool are you? And remember, there will still be one more final exam. 
Amen.